Now to my left is Professor James Steinberg, Dean of Syracuse University and former Deputy Secretary of State. And then a Professor Ambassador Ichiro Fujisaki, former ambassador to the US, now chairman of International Strategies at Sophia University. As you know, they have both played a major role in shaping foreign policy in Japan and the US and beyond. I understand the two have known each other since 1980s. Um, and um, firstly at the IISS, a think tank in London. And in 1990s, they were both in Washington DC in their respective capacity as US State Department Director of Policy Planning and Political Minister of Embassy of Japan. And more recently, during the first term of President Obama's administration, they met again in their capacities as Deputy Secretary of State and as Ambassador of Japan to the US. And both are now even more active in the academia. And um, in this session, I uh, plan in the time that we have to ask uh, perhaps uh, four or five questions and then welcome questions from the floor. Um, the, the first question, I mean, the, the questions that I'll be asking will be regarding um, well, their relationship that have gone on for so long and the current situation in Syria, the future of Asia Pacific and their experiences in the government um, that they might want to share uh, with um, all of us today. And lastly, the message to the students. And I am told that um, both of you have agreed to limit your comments to less than five minutes per question, uh, since you both have acquired skills to give two minutes briefings to presidents and prime ministers in your career. And so I am told this shouldn't be difficult. So uh, firstly, my first question, um, so your friendship have gone on for so many years, and I understand that does matter in terms of discussing foreign policy and planning it. Well, first of all, let me extend my congratulations to Sophia University on your 100th anniversary. And this is a very auspicious occasion, and I'm delighted to be able to share this with you and with the chancellor and so many of the students here. I'm delighted to have you here uh, in Washington, DC. And I think it's very important, and we'll talk about students later, because I think, uh, as you've seen, um, Ambassador Fujisaki and I have known each other now for uh, more than 25 years, probably pro approaching uh, 30 almost. Um, and uh, as you said, you know, one of the things that's been very special about the relationship between the United States and Japan is not just our shared interests between two governments, but the ties between our peoples. And you know, the relationship that we've had back from we were young scholars at the ISS through our own careers, working our way up through the diplomatic ladder uh, to play uh, ultimately fairly senior roles in government, I think is important because we not only uh, operate on an official level, but we have, we've come to an understanding of each other as people, uh, as our shared values, as our shared commitments to a world order that we want to be part of. And it's made such a difference, our ability to communicate with each other when there's a crisis, when we, when we need to, to work together on a problem, whether it's now between our two countries in dealing with Syria or when during the terrible crisis around Fukushima, uh, when the ambassador and I were able to, to draw on these strong bonds that our two countries had to try to come up with a common response. And we've seen this you know, throughout our careers, the ability to pick up the phone, to know the other partner and to have this with so many senior Japanese officials, both politicians and government officials, I think has made a huge difference in making sure that this kind of abstract notion of our shared interest is translated into an effective working relationship. And it's been a privilege for me over the years to work with Ambassador Fujisaki. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it's uh, Quite a long time ago that I was uh, at IISS uh, on my sabbatical and I was seconded to uh, uh, the, that institute in London. And uh, that time, there was a very young director there, and that's uh, James Steinberg. But people were saying that uh, he was a Harvard graduate, uh, or how do you say? Harvard graduate or whatever, <laughs> then uh, he was at the same class or say about the same time with uh, Bill Gates. And uh, everyone said that in the class said uh, Jim Steinberg was a lot smarter <laughs> than Bill Gates. 
Although in the end, uh, maybe Bill Gates had a little bit more fortune than Jim Steinberg, <laughs> but it doesn't ma matter. He was the smartest in the class. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he became a deputy national security advisor very quickly, and uh, then deputy secretary of state, and I was always helped, and I really was, uh, even when the difficult issues arose, I could uh, pick up the phone and call him, and uh, then I visit his office, and he would drag me into a little room. <laughs> it's, it's a big room, but uh, we, we discussed uh, just between ourselves uh, without any note taker, and uh, I would uh, really tell what's our bottom line, and uh, it was a really, uh, we, because of uh, the confidence between us, uh, trust relations, I think I was really uh, uh, fortunate to have that. In our first session in the morning, um, Professor Victor Cha was uh, referring to the significance of chemistry between people and leaders. So, Professor Steinberg, do you think that personal relationship might translate into a, like, country-level relationship? Ab absolutely. Between? There's no question about it. I mean, I, I think one, one should understand that at the end of the day, you are students of international relations, and you know that countries will do what's in their national interest. But I think the ability to understand each other, to be able to really have the kinds of conversations that Embed Fujisaki talks about, allows people to both find ways to solve problems when there are differences, but also to, to cooperate better when they have some understanding. And it operates at every level. It, it operates at the level of our leaders. You know, one of the things I think students need to understand is that um, although we think of our leaders as statesmen and diplomats, they're also political leaders. And so they can understand the challenges that each face, their own domestic politics, their problems. And when they build this relationship, they can say, here's, here's my problem. I want to try to work with you, but here are the constraints that I'm working under. And the ability to have those personal relationships, to be able to have those kind of candid conversations, to sit in each other's chair and kind of understand what's going on, I think really does make a, a big difference. I will say, and you know, turning to more you know, substantive issues that, you know, one of the challenges we face for a long time in U.S.-Japan relations is because we did go through a series of, of leadership changes in Japan that American presidents didn't have the same opportunity to build the kind of relationship that you had with long-standing prime ministers. Uh, but when you have a situation uh, now, for example, with uh, with uh, Abe San coming back as prime minister, somebody we all know well and the president knows, that does help because you do have a better sense of who your counterpart is and the ability to work together. You would agree? Yes, I totally agree. I think uh, we really had a little too uh, quick turnover for our prime ministership every year change, and I think uh, that really didn't uh, allow any foreign leader to really get to know our prime minister, and now I hope that uh, uh, Prime Minister will uh, stay longer and uh, able to really create uh, good relations with uh, other leaders. Uh, it's really crucial for the country. I totally agree. Well, both of you are now back in the academia, and um, I understand um, the President Obama is going to be speaking to the nation from 6 o'clock today, and, and Syria issue is on everybody's mind, I presume. Um, President Obama views that the UN Security Council is in a kind of a paralysis by not being able to respond to a crisis as such. Uh, but President Obama has not been able to demonstrate leadership domestically and internationally as to what options there are for the United States um, in, and also for the international community in terms of how nations might respond to a crisis of this magnitude. Um, so, Professor Steinberg, what challenge do you think this would uh, pose um, both for the U.S. and Japan? Well, first, I think it's important to understand this is an evolving situation. And I know and I understand from a media point of view, you want to kind of know where it is today and has the president succeeded or not succeeded. But I think ultimately we have to, we'll have to wait until we see how this plays out. And I think that there are clearly difficult challenges. I think certainly the American people uh, are worried and concerned about the possibility of another military engagement. But I think there's also an understanding that there are big stakes here. Uh, there are humanitarian stakes here. There are strategic stakes here. And I think we've seen, uh, as we saw with the president in St. Petersburg, that many other countries are supportive and are working with the United States. And I was very gratified to see both the very good conversation that obviously took place between Prime Minister Abe and, and President Obama on the topic of Syria and the fact that Japan joined with us and other uh, 
uh, of our friends and allies in making a strong statement about this. I think we certainly know of the importance that Japan attaches to the Security Council and working through international institutions. And I know the president, in the first instance, you know, clearly would like to use that avenue. But I think he also recognizes that there are sometimes challenges have to be faced and judgments have to be made. So I think we should see how this plays out. I think the, the fact that we've seen an evolution on the diplomatic front in the last few days reflects the fact that the president's strong statement about the need to enforce international norms may be helping to move the diplomacy forward. And everybody always prefers diplomacy to force if that can be done. So let's, uh, I think it's important to get behind the president here. I think he's made uh, a very a strong stand. And I think it, uh, you know, we'll see how this plays out in the coming days. As you say, this is a developing situation. But, but some say that the, uh, they are seeing the, the seat of the uh, United States presidency being undermined, in a sense. Would you subscribe to that view? Again, I think you have to wait to see what the outcome is. I think history will judge this based on the long term. And for example, I don't want to predict that this uh, idea of having, you know, turning over the chemical weapons to international control will succeed. But if it does, I think that will be seen as a great success for the president of marrying the threat of force with diplomacy. Uh, and so that's why I think it's, it's too soon to judge how this comes out. I think it's, you know, we face a challenge here, which is um, that the, on the one hand, the president, you know, has a very strong statement about the need to enforce the prohibition against the use of chemical weapons. On the other hand, you know, he understands in the long run, without the support of the American people, it's hard to move forward. So we'll see how his speech goes tonight and how he articulates to the American people and the Congress the path forward and, and the, whether he's able to gain the support for his approach. Professor Fujisaki, same yes, question uh, to you. Yes, uh, I think uh, Japan has a very similar uh, position with the United States as regard to chemical weapons so that we can not uh, allow any regime to use uh, this chemical weapon towards their people or other people. And that is a very clear uh, position of Japan. Now, it's, it is the United States who's now pondering not only the administration, but the Congress is going to think about it. I think we will uh, see uh, how it develops in this country. But uh, I think a Japanese, in general, position is that uh, we understand very clearly how U.S. is thinking. And uh, I don't, I'm not a government official, so I'm not in the position to speak on behalf of government. But uh, we uh, think that someone has to take a very strong attitude on these issues as well. Well, you've touched upon the uh, issue of uh, perhaps the durability of uh, US-Japan relationship in uh, managing a situation like this. So if I could follow up on that, Professor Fujisaki, uh, regarding the future of uh, Asia-Pacific, um, you know, we now have a new leader in Japan and in Korea and in China and also in North Korea. And uh, the situation is changing, um, while powers as China and India are facing challenges that may hinder economic growth. Uh, Japan is showing signs of comeback, and winning the um, 2020 Olympic bid will no doubt give a, a kind of a further boost both to the economy and to the sentiment um, of the Japanese. But at the same time, we do know that the problems continue <coughs> to remain, such as territorial disputes and history issues between Japan and the neighboring countries. Um, what then are the roles of Japan and the US to sustain peace and prosperity in the region in the years to come, do you think, Professor? Uh, two or three points. Uh, as regards uh, future of Asia Pacific, uh, as you say that we have new leaders in Japan, China, Korea, uh, and uh, North Korea. But the situations are very different. For example, Japan or ROK, it's a change, but uh, the very basis do not change. And no one will think that uh, Japan's uh, basic system of democracy or a free market system will not waver at all. It'll just there, be there. But uh, of course, there's nuance in policy uh, differences, like uh, what they had we had a year ago and now is very different, but still it's within a, a framework. Now maybe with the China or North Korea, it's, there could be a bigger change, but we have to wait and see because uh, what they have to be facing is a very base, maybe basic systematic change as well. Uh, uh, 
if, if these things will happen or not, we have to wait and see. Now, as for peace and stability in Asia Pacific, I think uh, all the countries have to do their effort, but United States has a very key role. Some people say that uh, uh, Japan may become more uh, uh, military oriented and uh, I don't take that view. And uh, I think as long as United States is a trustworthy partner, and I believe so, I don't think a major part of Japanese population thinks that we really have to change the basic course of Japan. So, uh, uh, because security is a deterrence. And as long as uh, US forces combined with Japanese force is a credible, gives a credible deterrence, I think uh, we can believe it and we, are in, uh, we don't have to change the course. I think that's how I look at it. Uh, the One more thing is, I'm sorry, I may be uh, passing five minutes, which I have uh, referred to, but uh, 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 talking about uh, US forces, uh, some American have said that it, American forces in Asia Pacific is like an oxygen. That's some was, was said 15 years ago. I don't buy that argument. As oxygen, oxygen meaning taken for granted. Oxygen means that uh, it's necessary. It's indispensable. I think uh, oxygen is something you don't feel, you don't smell, you don't see, and that. But military forces they have to do the training. Sometimes they have accidents as well. So you have to be always careful So in, to liken uh, that with uh, oxygen is a little bit too uh, dangerous. And I think US officials, administration, including military, have never taken that attitude. So I'm very happy. But some academics have referred to that. Oh, I see. So Professor Steinberg, you were nodding as you listened. Well, I, you know, I, I do think that uh, nobody would dispute the, the centrality of the Asia-Pacific region as, you know, really one of the most important uh, drivers of the international scene today on every front, on the economic front, on the political front, and on the security front. And it is a dynamic region. There's a lot of change taking place in many of the countries. And I think that uh, it is important to recognize, as Ambassador Fujisaki said, that that in, there is more stability in some places than others. And I think one of the great successes of uh, both US policy and the enormous efforts of the people of the region are the great success stories of Japan and South Korea over the last 60 years. And I think we can all feel great pride in the economic and political accomplishments. We have thriving economies. Uh, we have uh, strong democracies with strong commitment to the shared values that, that we all have. Um, and we have aspirations uh, to see those values and opportunities shared by everybody in the region. I think the challenge for all of us is how to, how to deal with the changes that are taking place, the enormous uh, development of China and India, uh, the rise of countries in Southeast Asia, and to make sure that we have a framework within which these countries can take their place and be active and grow in, in ways that don't uh, threaten the interests of others or destabilize the region. And the United States and Japan have been key partners in this by opening the door and keeping the door open to new countries, particularly to China, to not see China's rise as inherently a threat to our interests, but also be very clear that as China becomes more uh, successful, that it has responsibilities to the region as well. And I think we, we often say it, and, and it, it kind of, it's, you know, we, we, there's a little joke you know, on your computer where you hit F1 and you get an answer. The F1 of the US policy towards uh, East Asia is that Japan is the cornerstone. The US-Japan alliance is the cornerstone of that engagement. That was true 50 years ago, and it is true today. And I think something that, that I take a lot of personal satisfaction in, and I think, I hope that Ambassador Fujisaki does as well, is that this, the strength of that relationship is as, as good today as it has been at any time in our history. We have worked together through a changing dynamic in through the end of the Cold War into a very different uh, time in which we still, both sides recognize, and not just our governments, by the way, our publics recognize how central this relationship is. And I think that's something that gives me a lot of confidence is when I look at Japanese public opinion and the importance that, that the Japanese public attach 
to the US-Japan relationship and the importance that Americans attach to it and the positive feelings that Americans have towards, towards Japan, I think that gives me a lot of confidence about the future. And Professor Fujisaki, you are of the same view, perhaps, that the US-Japan relationship is as strong as ever? I think I, uh, I, well, uh, strong as ever. I, you see, uh, all the leaders have been saying that all, all the way that, uh, hey, the US-Japan relations have never been better. And uh, then US-Japan relations have come up and up and up, but uh, in reality, I think this were up and down. And uh, But now, uh, very frankly, I've been experiencing that it has gone a little down and now, now it's picking up. I think it's uh, that kind of wave rather than going up and up. But uh, often leaders say it never has been better and it's going up and up. But uh, in reality, it's something like that. And you felt that? Yes. <laughs> But Professor Steinberg, given the uh, growing uh, instability perhaps in the Middle East, like uh, in Syria, of course, in Egypt or in Iran, um, would that have a, an impact on the so-called uh, US uh, rebalancing uh, Asia? You know, I think that the, the, certainly the president has been very clear that, um, that he understood from the beginning that the rebalancing did not mean ignoring the Middle East, that we all continue to have important stakes there. But I think it's also the case that um, one of the things, the lessons that, that we have learned is however important and however urgent the issues appear to be in the Middle East right now, that we have huge long-term stakes uh, in East Asia. And it's important for it not to look like our attention wavers. And I mean, you can talk about waves, but I think what's important is not to have waves and that the steadiness of our engagement, notwithstanding the fact that the headlines today may be in Syria, is for there to be the, the confidence that the United States is in East Asia for the long run, that we're not going to, when there's a crisis in, in the Middle East, pull our troops out or lo lose our focus. Uh, because I think that sustained confidence that Ambassador Fujisaki talked about in the U.S., the non-oxygen, the visible, credible engagement of the United States is central to making the transitions that need to take place in East Asia over the long run. So, you know, I think it's we, we as a country, as a great power, need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time to attend to the, these current crises in the Middle East without losing our focus and commitment to sustained engagement in East Asia. Professor Fujisaki, uh, Professor Steinberg had earlier talked about the, um, the robust uh, growth in uh, Asia and the need for both the US and Japan to engage the region. Um, one region, obviously, would be not only East Asia, but Southeast Asia, the ASEAN states, which is said to be the, the growing engine of the world economy today. Um, is there a, um, a way for both US and Japan to uh, effectively engage the region? Yes, I think, uh, first of all, uh, as for the uh, rebalancing or pivot, uh, I think uh, uh, I'm not in the position to explain about U.S. policy, it's Jim, but uh, uh, U.S. has had to put a little bit uh, more energy and uh, uh, attention to Middle East for some time, for the last 10 years, and uh, maybe uh, they thought that it's not uh, uh, the right balance, so they have to come back a little bit more. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, Middle East continues to be a very important uh, area for not only for the United States, but for the world as a whole. So I think uh, Middle East continues to be a very important area. Now, as for uh, Southeast uh, Asia, I think it was... Uh, 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 when uh, he was uh, Deputy Secretary, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, established ASEAN ambassador, uh, joined EAS and uh, TPP, and all this uh, started uh, in the last five, six years. So uh, I think uh, U.S. has been focusing on that. And very frankly, Japan has been doing that as well. Uh, uh, in some cases before uh, United States, some cases following United States, but uh, all in all, we are, our sort of uh, tempo was not that different and uh, focusing on uh, that area is a very important uh, strategic area for both of us. And it doesn't necessarily mean uh, containing China as a result? 
I don't think that uh, there's any support anywhere for containing China. I think that uh, the countries of the region want to have a good relationship with China, and they want to have a good relationship with the United States. They want, they, China is, is essential to their future. It's essential to their economic future. It's essential to their political future. But I think they, at the same time, they understand that it's easier for the countries of East Asia, and particularly Southeast Asia, to have a good relationship with China if they know the United States is present as well, and that they, they have multiple relationships and multiple options. So I think that, that it is, it, they would be troubled and I think it would be a mistake for our policy to be one of asking countries to pick sides and to be for the US. Or, but I think that at the same time, it is quite important. And I think that's why you see you know, broad welcome throughout uh, Southeast Asia for the US engagement and these new relationships that we have with the countries of Southeast Asia, because it, it creates an environment where they can have good relationships with others. And it also you know, makes clear that this is a region where everybody needs to be engaged. Professor Fujisaki, would I be right in saying that, as Professor Steinberg says, uh, it won't be in the interest of anybody to be seen as we are imposing upon the Southeast Asian nations to um, choose like either or, ma make either or decision? No, I have never thought in that sense as well. And I think we've been uh, trying to improve relations with India, we've been trying to uh, improve relations with Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, and uh, those policies uh, were doing, we were doing that in, in its own right and not to try to contain some country. Uh, I think uh, these countries themselves are very important countries for us. Well, since um, there are many students who are gathered here for the event today, um, they will be thrilled um, if you could share with us your uh, experience from your service. Um, what, for example, what was the most challenging aspect of working for the government and the most rewarding part of it, um, Professor Steinberg? Well, the, I think public service is enormously re rewarding, and I you know, encourage all of you to think about how that fits into your career. I mean, I think the ability to put your, your, your intellect and your energy into something to, in the way, best way you can to improve the common good is a, is, is a satisfaction which is without peer. Um, and I think it's something when you come home at night and tired and you've had a difficult day, and you, do you think about it in those terms? I think it really makes a big difference. Um, the biggest challenge, frankly, um, is that because we live in democracies, uh, we have to deal with competing views and competing voices, and you have to try to find ways to understand the different perspectives, to try to build consensus, to try to find common ground. It's not like you can kind of go into your classroom and figure out what the best policy is and wave your magic wand, and that's the way it is. You have to, you have to persuade others. You have to, get, you have to explain why you've chosen what you do. You have to address the concerns and, and, and different perspectives of other people. And so I think that's a, a skill that many of you need to think about. We, we often in schools sort of do the analytics and try to think, you know, what's the best answer to the question? But it's also, you have to figure out how do you build political consensus? How do you bring people along? That's a big challenge, but as Winston Churchill said, the problem with democracy, it's the worst of all systems except for all the others. I think the rewards, you know, for me, you know, the opportunity to be part of situations where you really can feel you've made a difference. I mean, for me, I spent a lot of time in my career first when I worked for Senator Kennedy in the, the Senate and then with uh, President Clinton working on the conflict in Northern Ireland. And to be able to work with uh, Senator Mitchell and helping to build a peace agreement that's brought peace to a, uh, a place which had seen violence and terrible tragedy uh, is obviously a spectacularly uh, rewarding uh, set of opportunities, but it's also the ability to work with friends. And I mentioned the, the Fukushima tragedy because, you know, for me that was also rewarding. This was a situation which was a very tense and difficult one for the Japanese government, for America, and for America's friends in Japan. And the fact that we were able to come together and to try to find ways to work together to, to, to address this problem and to be seen as partners, uh, I found very personally rewarding, and it really kind of vindicated the investment that we'd made uh, in each other for a long time, and, and something that we, I think we all felt good at the end, that we had been able to traverse this very perilous set of, of issues that had huge consequences for the people of Japan, for the people of the region, and for the relationship between the United States and Japan. It was another example of how public service can bring uh, great personal rewards.
So you would say almost every day um, of your service was satisfactory and rewarding. I, you know, again, I think that, that the, the, the thing that makes the difference is however hard it is, is to feel that you're working for something that's bigger than yourself. And I, and I find that very, very tangible. I mean, and, and you know, you, I remember many times when I was at the White House and, you know, you had been there and it'd been a long day and night and you'd walk out and you'd kind of turn around and you'd look at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and you'd say, what a privilege and honor it is to be able to work and to try to do something for, for the public good. And to come back to that office and the next morning. to come back morning. to the office very early the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And you share that view, Professor Hujizaki. Yes. Uh, I, uh, when I was a student in college, I want, thought that uh, how, what I want to do, and uh, I wanted to work for government, and that's because uh, uh, I think I was able to work for national interest in that sense, uh, rather than for one company's interest or whatever. And uh, 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 one good thing about uh, being in government was that uh, you, your job would be very much varied. One day you're working on uh, uh, trade policy, two years later you're working on, or one week later you're working on some security issues, and uh, you have so, so many varieties, so you're not, you, you don't get bored. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a challenging thing, because uh, you go to a new job, and uh, you really gobble up all the documents and try to put it in, and two weeks later you give an interview like uh, if you were known that for years. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it's not an easy... You've got to be a quick study. Yeah, very quick study. But uh, I think it was uh, really uh, uh, fulfilling uh, to try to do those things. And if you have... Sometimes you think uh, you haven't done that, to your standard and uh, uh, you feel a bit of dismay, but I think uh, all in all, I think that was rewarding. The uh, difficult uh, experience uh, I had was uh, 311 uh, and uh, I was ambassador here. Uh, the difficulty was that uh, Tokyo was in disarray, uh, very uh, frankly, and uh, no instruction was coming and uh, we had to manage it, but uh, US side uh, led by uh, people like Jim Steinberg, really was helpful. And uh, we were uh, trying to, uh, we were communicating every day with the US government and sending information and getting, sending requests to US side. And uh, uh, I was saying that uh, the day is 24 hours, but uh, because of 12 hour time difference, you know, these kids have uh, now been jet lagged. Uh, but, uh, uh, because of a 12 hour time difference, when we finish the job in the evening and uh, we send the result to Tokyo, in the morning we'll get the result because of that. So we were able to use uh, 20, 36 hours out of 24 <laughs> hours and I think that was very, and so uh, it was a very challenging time but uh, helped enormously by American friends. Thank you very much. And both of you, um I mean, was joining the Foreign Service was something that uh, was always in your mind since your youth, or...? Well, I, I wasn't part of the Foreign Service, but I, but I have always been involved in public service, and I've, in a variety of different ways. I mean, I, my privilege uh, is I've worked in all three branches of the federal government. I worked in Congress, I worked in uh, uh, the executive branch, I worked as a clerk in the, in the federal courts. I've also worked in local government. I worked uh, for the mayor of Boston and for the city council in Boston. So. I've had the privilege, you know, of working at every level uh, uh, over the years, and it's something, you know, I, I'm of the generation, uh, and I'll show you my age to all of you, which is, was inspired by President Kennedy and his famous, you know, question of ask not what you can do, uh, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And so from really when I was very young, that was my goal and my hope for what I would be able to do, and I've been privileged to, to be able to serve in a variety of ways. Was, Basically, same with you, Professor Fujisaki. Yes, and uh, I was talking about 311 and uh, embassy job, and uh, some of my former embassy colleagues are now uh, Georgetown student and uh, here <laughs> as well. Then <laughs> uh, I'm sure students have questions that they want to ask, but my last question to you is regarding what message and you might have for the students. Now, what should they keep in mind um, as they start thinking about their own career? 
uh, that they might, might want to build and what should they um, accomplish while being a student either at the Georgetown or at Sofia? What would you say? So I would have two bits of advice. I'll make it three, three bits of advice. Um, the first is um, something, you know, I'm the dean of a school called the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. And I hope that as your students, you think about how your studies help to make you better citizens, whatever your choices are for your careers. That this is, this is, we are privileged, we're both privileged to live in democracies, but democracy is a privilege and it requires uh, people to give as well as to get and to think about how and how your studies can help you be stronger, more effective citizens in your society and to strengthen the democracy and the society that you live in. That's the first. The second is study history. I, I'm, I'm a passionate believer that we need to understand where we came from in order to understand where we're going. And not just our own history. Um, the Americans need to study more than just American history, although we need to understand our own history. Japanese under, need to understand not just their history, but others, because we need to understand where others are coming from, too. And that history is unique in its ability to sensitize us to the successes and failures of others, to the different choices and the different perspectives that people bring. Many other good things to study, political science, economics, anthropology, all the things that we teach in my school, but you know, first among all, I think, is, is history. And the final thing I would say to you, and I say to all my students, is be open-minded. You may have ideas right now about what kind of career you want, but be open to new ideas and new paths. Sometimes things come in surprising ways. You know, I started my career, you asked, um, in terms of public service, working in state and local government. And, and when I first came to Washington, I worked for uh, the secretary of what was then called the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And the issues I was interested in were health care and transportation and all the things that local governments uh, like. And I hadn't really thought that much about international relations. I'd studied a little bit. I'd taken some world history courses and the like. But I, I found myself um, in one of my early jobs working at the Justice Department uh, on the morning of November 4th, 1979, which will not mean a lot to you Japanese, but many Americans will remember that that's the day that Americans, uh, our diplomats were taken hostage in Tehran. And uh, although my job had nothing to do with international relations, it was a Sunday morning, and because I was a young staffer at the Justice Department, I happened to be there at seven o'clock in the morning when the Attorney General called down to my boss, who was a senior Justice Department official, who was not there. And he said, well, she's not, I said, she's not there. He said, well, can you come up to my office and join me at this meeting at the White House where we're going to try to figure out what we're going to do about the hostages? From that moment on, I started working in national security. I had never contemplated that as part of my career. But you know, the rest is history, as they say, and it, it turned out to me to be an exciting set of challenges and issues, and I've you know, never turned back. So be open-minded. Realize that there are lots of different ways you can, your career's twists and turns uh, can go, and be open to the new opportunities. It seems you had what it takes to be you know, what, what you wanted to achieve. You know, I think it's, uh, it's always a little bit of perseverance, it's a little bit of luck, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's being able to really be able to be flexible and adaptive. I think this is one of the great challenges of education. You know, we're having great debates now about the role of higher education, what should we be teaching students. But I think the key, and as a teacher, I feel very strongly about this, is I, when I teach and I engage with my students, I want to teach them how to deal with the problem that they're going to encounter 20 years from now, not the problem of today. Because you aren't going to be in leadership positions tomorrow, but you will be in 20 years. And what are the skills and perspectives that I can give you that will not answer today's questions, but prepare you to be able to answer? And I think I was fortunate to have the kind of education, I went to great schools, that helped me develop the intellectual tools to be able to live in a very changing and adaptive world. And so I could move from one field to another because it wasn't just that I was a specialist in one little area, but I had the kind of intellectual openness to be able to take on new challenges. I uh, almost going to echo what uh, Jim Steinberg said. Uh, one, I think uh, you should uh, concentrate on things that could be utilized, used in 10 years, 20 years, like uh, James Steinberg said. Uh, because uh, if you try to dig into something, a uh, very narrow field and become a specialist, for example, if you were 
uh, try to study uh, Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party, maybe, and you become a very expert of it, maybe 20 years later, it's not there. Uh, so, uh, no, maybe it'll be even stronger, but uh, if you study, for example, Chinese language, they'll always be there. And uh, if you study history, I think that's a good idea. But study also the recent history of uh, last 50 years, not only the very Egyptian or Greece, though those are very, could be a <clears throat> give a very good hint as well, but uh, I think the last 50 years is very important uh, as well. Third thing is uh, uh, what they say, critical thinking and uh, how to express, uh, because uh, that is what I'm trying to teach as well. Don't just believe what uh, President Obama says or Mr. Abe says. You have to think, or even the professors. Uh, you Especially to, the professors. <laughs> yeah, you have to think yourself and uh, have a doubt and try to ask yourself, why is this so? Why is he saying this? And that's the most important thing, I think. And then try to exp express yourself very succinctly not try to speak long, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. You, in real case, like uh, what uh, Dorian San said, if we are to brief our top people, you have to do it in three minutes and talk, talk a whole range of issue. And you have to, pre even if you go to company or if you go to media, you're not given 30 minutes to uh, focus on one subject. It's three minutes. So. Train yourself to that, I think, is one thing. that It's a little bit of skill, but uh, it's not only a skill. It's how to grasp the essence of the issue. Well, in the time that remains, um, I would like to take the questions from the floor. And uh, as Professor Kujisek said, please be as brief <laughs> and to the point as possible so that uh, many people would be able to have their turns too. And I will be uh, partial here in giving a younger generation more chances. So please raise your hand if you have questions. I have one hand here and a gentleman towards the back. Thank you very much, sirs. Um, I'm Minai Kari. I'm a junior majoring in law in Sofia University. Um, I would like to ask a question about Syria. I think um, Mr. Ueki has um, presented us an idea about using the ICC for Syria, if Syria has actually used the chemical weapons. And I would like to know what you think about it. Thank you very much. You know, I think the ICC can be an important element of an overall strategy, but I think that the, we've recognized, uh, and we've seen this in many other cases, of the difficulty of using it as a, an effective and timely intervention. Um, it, should, uh, it should not be excluded, but uh, the ability both to bring proceedings through the ICC takes a long time. Uh, there are many uh, logistical difficulties. Uh, it's certainly, it's very difficult to, uh, to gain uh, the access to the individuals in question to be able to actually bring them to The Hague and to, uh, to bring them before justice in that respect. And so while it's a valuable tool, I think it, it can't be the sole answer to situations like this where the, the stakes are very high and where a, a state has been involved in, uh, in activities of this sort. So I think uh, it's important not to lose the value of that as a norm setting and establishing the principle of individual accountability. But I think we also have to be prepared to use some of the other tools uh, that we have, including, as the President has made clear, the, the possibility of the use of force to enforce um, these very important norms. I think it's, uh, we have to think of stages. First uh, stage is to let them stop using it. Second, uh, ab let them abandon the weapon like uh, Secretary Kerry uh, has suggested, and I, I hope that this will happen. Third, e if everything is, uh, uh, well, uh, this regime is finished, uh, hopefully in years to come, then maybe it's the time of uh, ICCJ. So uh, it's not that uh, bring in ICCJ when the uh, Assad is there. It's, uh, I think, a later stage. We have to think in stages. I 
Hi, my name is John. I'm a graduate student in the School of Foreign Service here. First, I'd like to thank our speakers for talking with us today. Um, my question uh, is regards to um, uh, U.S. engagement with Syria and the implications for U.S.-Japan relations. Um, it's, I know we should wait and see what happens, but it seems apparent to me that U.S. leadership has been wavering and a little bit unsure, and polls have shown that the American people are also um, war-weary, that we're not willing to commit anymore to further wars in the Middle East. Um, given this kind of attitude, um, what kind of message does that send to Japan? Does that mean that we're becoming a weaker security ally, and does this add strength to the argument within Japan that Article 9 should be changed, that Japan should remilitarize, and that they should um, take more responsibility for their own security. Thank you. Well, I, I think, first of all, I mean, I, I will reiterate. I mean, I don't, I don't think, you know, until we know what the outcome is. I mean, there, there are many uh, occasions. Um, I will tell you, for example, uh, that um, I was very involved in, in Balkans policy during the Clinton administration. And as the tragedy began to unfold in Kosovo uh, for uh, beginning in um, the winter of uh, 1998, there were a lot of people who said, oh, the Clinton administration hasn't done anything, the credibility is shot, you're focusing on diplomacy. Meanwhile, Milosevic is killing people and, and, and co committing ethnic cleansing and forcing people out of the country. But at the end of the day, we used force, we, we ended the ethnic cleansing, and ultimately Milosevic was removed from power. And everybody now looks back on this and they argue about whether it was legal or not legal, but the fact is it was seen as a very effective example of American leadership. And it was important that it was done in stages as we began to develop the international coalition that we needed. So it, I, this is not just a dodge to say, let's see how it comes out. This will be judged by how it comes out. And it may come out badly, in which case the concerns that you raise will be legitimate concerns, but it may not. Having said that, I also think it's important to understand the differences here, too. Um, we don't have, this is not a question of a, a security commitment which the United States has made and has a treaty obligation to, uh, to meet. Uh, and therefore, you know, whether or not uh, we choose to engage uh, ultimately in Syria, I don't think reflects on the question about how the United States would meet its commitments to Japan under Article 5 of the Security Treaty. And I think it is important to recognize that the, the situations are different and that one can't easily uh, abstract from one to the other. Obviously, there are overtones and concerns that will be raised, but I think it would be important for all the audiences to understand that you know, whatever Congress's reluctance is to support military action in Syria, I don't think reflects a question about how they would feel if the security treaty between the United States and Japan was actually implicated by events uh, that were covered by the treaty. I totally agree with the latter part of uh, what uh, Steinberg said, because uh, I, I don't think it has nothing to do with uh, uh, the uh, confidence that Japan puts in the United States, uh, because it, it doesn't matter, the, uh, it doesn't relate to a security commitment. Uh, if uh, US takes a uh, uh, rather uh, wavered uh, attitude towards uh, some uh, uh, island issue or whatever, then there could be some discussion on, hey, can United States be trusted? But US has been very adamant, very clear in saying that uh, uh, US, uh, Japan Security Treaty Article 5 covers the island, and I think uh, uh, we've been uh, pretty much assured by that. Thing. So this uh, attitude on Syria, I, I don't think have uh, any relations with the influence on the, our thinking of uh, uh, constitution. Uh, of course, uh, this is my personal view, and uh, they, there may be some uh, people who have a di very different views, but uh, uh, this is how I think. And as the question went, uh, do you think it might have any impact on the so-called uh, image of the United States worldwide? Of, of course, the situation is evolving. Sorry? Um, the, uh, the gentleman asked uh, whether the, the fact that the uh, situation seemingly is uh, facing a sort of an impasse for, impasse for the moment. I mean, the situation is, of course, evolving. Would it have any uh, impact on the, the United States image worldwide? You know, I think the problem is that... I think, I'm sorry. Good. I think I, I was clear on that. I said uh, this, has, uh, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, at least U.S.-Japan security relations. I don't know what people have 
the image of the United States. I think that's an individual to decide. But uh, as for more political security relations, I don't think there's any relations. I'm sorry. I, I just also say that, you know, I mean, I don't think, it's not as if global publics are clamoring for the United States to intervene in Syria. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not so. It's a, it's a very complicated issue in terms of where, where public opinion is, not just in the United States, but around the world. And if it gets to it, and the president does use military force, there are going to be a whole set of right. responses about people yes. who are unhappy about that, too. So I think that there is, there's no doubt this is a very complex issue in terms of the implications of either acting or not acting. Mm -hmm. There are consequences, and, and people will draw certain implications where the president chooses to act. They will draw. Uh, and so that's why... Again, I'll say it, you know, one should give the president the option of trying to find an answer which meets the broad desire to, to demonstrate our commitment to stop the use of chemical weapons with ways that, if possible, to avoid the use of force would be the best of all worlds. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't say that I'm optimistic that this new proposal is going to succeed. But I think there's a huge reason to, to, to try to play it out and see whether it can ma be made to do, because it actually could be the best of all worlds, if we can reinforce the norm, if we can end this horrible regime, Syria being one of the handful of countries that has not signed the Chemical Weapons Convention, that still has and uses chemical weapons, if the bottom line is because of the threat of force that Syria gives up its chemical weapons program, signs and complies with the CWC, that would be a great achievement for the president and should be very reassuring both to people who worry about whether the United States is engaged and people who worry about the, the United States being a little too you know, trigger happy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, again, that's why it's so important to see what the, the ultimate outcome is and, 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 to, and to give some space for uh, a result which would meet the twin goals of avoiding force if it's possible, mm -hmm. but also making sure that this act is not uh, uh, condoned. Well, since you have served both the White House and the State Department. You know, President Obama is going to speak in about 15 minutes and uh, none of us will be seeing the, uh, the speech live on television. Would you have any idea as to what are the central message that the President Obama might want to convey to the nation? At this point, I, I, I don't know. Obviously, <laughs> oh, okay. um, well, you're, not, you're not in the government anymore. So. <laughs> but I suspect that it's exactly what I said, which is that that he's serious about the 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 importance of of enforcing the the commitment against the use, mm -hmm. uh, but that all presidents uh, obviously prefer if they can find a way to do this through diplomacy and to sustain broad international support for it is, is something that he f would feel not only obliged to pursue but actually would be in the interest of all uh, to try to do it, and that uh, that that's what he is seeking to do in this case. Mm -hmm. Um, any more questions from the floor? Uh, one gentleman here and then a uh, gentleman over there. Uh, I'm from Sofia University. Um, my name is Chikama Sawakabayashi. Um, my question is not the issue of uh, Japan and the United States, maybe. Uh, I want to question like um, about the Cairo, what's happening in the battle in Cairo. What do you think about that issues? That's it. The situation in Egypt. Yeah, in Egypt, yes. And the uh, outcome of the so-called Arab Spring, yes. perhaps. Uh, uh, in a way, I think, uh, very frankly, this was uh, predictable. And uh, at the same time, it was inevitable, too. Because uh, when uh, some leader who has been uh, in power is uh, uh, a little abusing his power and uh, people turn uh, their back against uh, the leader. Uh, he's forced out, but uh, then one comes in, uh, is not prepared really to rule and uh, some months later uh, he proves that he can't really. And then it's not uh, fortunate, but uh, military would take a... Uh, well, we hope that uh, very soon that military would uh, give uh, the uh, authority back to civilian. But uh, I thought that uh, it was rather difficult for the uh, uh, regime uh, which took over from Mubarak to stay uh, with that uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, 
uh, policy and uh, uh, try to uh, uh, revive the economy there. So uh, this was uh, rather unfortunate, but uh, inevitable course. That was uh, how I, and the predictable as well. That was how I was seeing the situation. I very much share that view. I mean, I, you know, there's a, a saying which has been attributed to Zhou Enlai, which I'm quite sure is apocryphal, but he was once supposedly asked what his view was of the French Revolution, and he said it's too soon to say. Um, and you know, I think that this exactly what uh, Ambassador Fuchsak said, which is that we do, there is a pattern of the way in which revolution and democratic reform take place. And it did happen in the French Revolution, right? If you think about the course of that, it has happened in many others, which is that, that the, the change of the LCM regime comes about because of social and political and economic forces that make the old order unsustainable. But that doesn't mean that the new order is going to be born full and, and every form uh, instantly thereafter. And it will take a lot of time to work out. The society, having been deprived of the opportunity for civil society to develop, for the press and others, for tolerance, it, you know, it would be surprising, as the ambassador said, for it to, to go smoothly thereafter. And there is a dynamic. So the challenge for those of us on the outside is on the one hand to keep a steady gaze on where you want this to come out on the, in the long hand, but understand that it's not going to be a kind of a straight line progression towards a fully blown, mature, mm. democratic, open society. And we need to make clear that that the the actions of the military raise deep concerns. On the other hand, the, the, the behavior of the previous government under the Muslim Brotherhood also raises deep concerns and try to help the Egyptian people navigate this very challenging and long-term process that they need to undergo. And I think uh, we had a hand up over there. And questions in Japanese are also welcome. Please. Um, hi, I'm Ben Brown. I'm a freshman in the SFS. Um, I wanted to ask you regarding the Senkaku Islands. I think the American media has been very eager to speculate that tensions over this issue may escalate into a conflict or even war. Uh, do you think that the strong and growing economic uh, bonds between the U.S. and China, Japan and China, could help uh, diffuse tensions, and if not, what can? Who's going to? Yes, I uh, truly hope so. That uh, uh, that means that uh, China would uh, stop aggression uh, towards that island, and uh, I really hope that they will do so. Uh, my uh, thinking, personal thinking, is that uh, on this issue, there are three principles to that from Japanese point of view. We cannot make any compromise uh, because this is a territorial issue like the uh, uh, UK had with Ar Argentine. Uh, you cannot really make compromise. This because if you, people say that uh, start negotiations, but uh, if you start negotiations, 100 to 0 is not possible. You have to have, if you start negotiation, it's, it's going to be 90, 10, or 80, 20. And I think in this case, uh, no Japanese would accept that because of our historical legal position. Second point is that uh, we should not take off guard. So uh, we have to be very careful in uh, defending the island. Third is that the principle is no provocation. I think Japan should be very cautious in not trying to stimulate and try to take further attitude. I think we should keep to the uh, status quo and try not to do anything more. And uh, as long as uh, this situation continues, as you say, economic relations is important, and I hope that this will be realized by our good old Chinese friends. Thank you very much. So the, the one thing that both China and Japan agree on with respect to the Senkakos is both believe there's no dispute. Um, <laughs> and that's the problem, of course. Um, and, and so the challenge is, and I totally understand the ambassador's point of view. I understand from the Japanese point of view why the position has to be we can't negotiate because sovereignty is uh, a binary thing, but it's also the, Jap the Chinese position. So I think we have, to, we have to understand that there's a core problem here which is not easily solved. If, if, if both sides are making uh, assertions which are absolutely incompatible with the other, you have a problem. And so the question is, how do we live with that? 
Uh, but the good news is, uh, as the ambassador knows well, we've actually lived with this for a long time, right? I mean, this is the, the dispute has existed for some time, uh, and yet it was not a major source of tension in Sino-Japanese relations. So I think we need to look back at the period of time when this binary disagreement was managed through wisdom and, and, and an eye on exactly what you said, the broader interest of all sides. And I think if that's kept in mind, uh, it's clear that there is a way to live with this disagreement. Uh, and I think you know, that, that it's important for both sides to do it. From the US perspective, uh, there, the, the, the one thing that is quite important here, and I, and I appreciate what the ambassador said about no provocations, it has to be for everybody, that this, there's simply no excuse, however strongly you feel about the sovereignty claims, and I understand both sides feel very strongly about it, that there's, it simply doesn't justify the use of force or coercion to try to uh, pursue them. And that, I think, is an absolute in this case. And from the US perspective, that has to be the governing principle, that people have to understand you can be absolutely determined that your position is right, but that doesn't justify uh, the use of force as a, as a means to resolve it, or coercion, or the, or the threat of force. I'm not going into this, uh, and uh, but uh, just to, uh, very uh, short remarks about the uh, history. Uh, it was uh, Japan declared this uh, uh, island as a uh, ter uh, Japanese territory in 1895, and up until 1970, no claim was made. And even after that, uh, uh, we have uh, administered. Uh, uh, authority and that was not challenged. So it's a, a, not a very long term, but it's a rather recent issue. And I think it's unfortunate. Maybe there was some uh, mistake on uh, both sides, but I hope that uh, uh, this could be uh, sort of solved uh, uh, very uh, uh, soon. But uh, uh, I just wanted to put it into perspective from my point of view. Any more questions um, in English or in Japanese? So two more, and this will be the last two questions. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Yu from Sophia University, and I want to about, uh, ask about one question about North Korea. Um, since several months ago, um, North Korea accomplished its nuclear experiment without any advanced information, even to China or to Korea. Korea. So, um, and this thing, um, also many Chinese governments, they are very surprised. So, um, if ch and now the US-Japan relationships could prevent, um, if um, the con condition of North Korea uh, lose control. And can I ask one other tiny question? Is it really tiny? Yes. Um, <laughs> and about you two, and during your long and strong friendship, and what is the question you ar argued with each other? That's a big both? question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's and all. Thank you. Thank you. And, and maybe uh, we could ask the gentleman to ask his question, and if you could please um, answer in one go. I'm Kentaro Nishimura from Sofia University. Uh, when I think of balance of power in Eastern Asia, uh, Japan should change the change a part of part of the constitution and increase military budget in order to cope with aggressive attitude of China. Uh, so then, what impact does this change give? Uh, Asia Pacific region, especially America. Does America accept this reform or refuse? So, who's going to go first? <laughs> so, Professor Steinberg. Um, so, first on North Korea, um, this has obviously been one of the most difficult challenges we've faced, and it's been frankly frustrating. I've spent a good part of my career in two administrations trying to deal with the North Korea problem. And on the one hand, we clearly have not succeeded and stopping them from moving forward with their nuclear program. Uh, but we, we operate under some constraints because we, on the one hand, this is, this is both dangerous for the region and it has broader implications for non-proliferation around the world. On the other hand, we also have to worry about the safety and stability of the, the peninsula and particularly the people in South Korea who are you know, in a, a very exposed and vulnerable position. Um, 
this is one in which we have to, I, I think that the, the, the relatively small bit of good news is I think that since um, Kim Jong-un took power and the, the, the most recent nuclear test, that there's been a growing awareness, uh, not just in Japan and the United States and South Korea, but in China about how dangerous the possibilities are there. And there are some glimmers of hope. We've seen you know, more restraint in recent months on the North Korean part. And I think it's in part from a recognition that the new leadership of China is less tolerant of the kind of behavior that they've seen. So it's critical that we all continue to work together, that we not abandon our strong view that, that the complete denuclearization of North Korea is the objective, that we will not you know, just accept a nuclear North Korea, and that there will continue to be significant consequences, economic and political, for North Korea. That doesn't solve the problem overnight. It obviously hasn't up till now, but I still think it's the right long-term strategy uh, uh, to pursue. On Japan's role, I, I now speak entirely for myself. Um, I, I, I don't know that there's a necessity to change the constitution in Japan, but I, I do believe that updating the idea of collective security makes sense. I think that Japan you know, is a signatory to the UN Charter. The concept of collective security is one that's broadly accepted. And I think working within that framework that, that Japan is, should be a country that can participate in those basic norms. And so in that sense, whether you call it an interpretation or just a, an updating of the way in which uh, Japan understands uh, how it operates, I personally am comfortable with that, uh, that discussion. On the things that we've disagreed about, I think the most important disagreement is where you find the best sushi in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> then, Ambassador, please. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, talking about North Korea, the very important thing is the time element. Uh, of course, uh, North Korean leaders are going to be there all the time, and negotiators are there for two decades. We on our side, America, Japan, change all the time. So they are not in a hurry to make any deal. But they try to uh, play many cards, sometimes a very uh, uh, soft, uh, throw softball, sometimes a, a very hard attitude. And what's important is to stay firm. And what's important is to not stay firm only by yourself, but try to work with United States, Japan, ROK, China, and with Russia as well. And that is the only solution that to try to give a necessary pressure to DPRK. If, if you are divided, if you, they think that they can drive wedge into these relations, they will never try to give in. So I think continue that form of is so important. Now, uh, as for uh, constitution, uh, I'm of the view uh, that uh, we could uh, uh, review the interpretation uh, of uh, Article 9 if the security uh, situation changes. Uh, these uh, interpretation could change from time to time on other uh, issues as well. And I've spoken that and I've given an interview to that as well. Before you modify the uh, legal framework, you can l really look at that. But uh, anyway, uh, my view is that it's Japan to decide, Japanese people to decide. And uh, uh, it's not, uh, you don't have to ask Chinese or Americans how we should do it. It's uh, you, our constitution. We'll think about it. But uh, uh, in my view, uh, uh, tr try to sort of uh, change constitution for China's uh, aggressive attitude, I, th I think is not how we should do it. I think we'll see that, hope that China itself will change its attitude uh, first. Uh, China have a history of uh, reviewing its policy. Uh, and sometimes they have uh, really uh, altered the uh, interpretation of what they have done. We have seen several times, cultural revolution, all these things. And I hope that this attitude that they are taken now may be reviewed in several years' time as well. Uh, 
As for uh, uh, what uh, uh, Jim Steinberg has said about sushi, I don't know, but uh, really uh, I have uh, asked uh, so many uh, favor on him, for example, on elections of uh, some international organization, and uh, he really helped on us. Uh, so uh, you think of uh, some uh, 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 of our uh, cases, uh, uh, I, I never forget uh, how really he helped on that. So it's not a disagreement. Uh, but, and uh, I uh, and one last thing I want to say is that uh, this seminar was so important to me. This was uh, my first uh, endeavor, enterprise in Sofia University this year. And uh, I thought I needed a very good last speaker. Good first speaker and last speaker. I asked Tom Daschle to be the first speaker. I asked Jim Steinberg to be last speaker. And uh, I thought we need a good overall moderator. And I begged uh, <laughs> Aiko Doden and was able to persuade her. And I thought uh, I got the consent of Tom Daschle, I got the uh, consent of Jim Steinberg, I got the consent of Aiko Doden, and I thought we'll have a, we'd have a great success, and I had it. So uh, let's give them a big applause, including Doden. <laughs>